Amen. Hey, one more shout of praise to the Lord. And if you were ministered by the youth this morning, because I know I was. Awesome. Great job. Man, it's good to be in the Lord's presence, and it's good to see the youth just hearing that call and coming, rising to that challenge. So why don't we pray? Lord, thank you so much for today. We ask your blessing on the rest of this time and your anointing. Lord, go with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids can be dismissed, three to 11-year-olds. About time, I know it. It's about time you could go, go on upstairs. Oh, was that cool or what? That was amazing. So cool. And um, it's so cool that I could be up here. Um, I know it's like I've been MIA, right? Like, no, it's really me in the flesh. I'm here this morning because uh, I know uh, there was JP filled in the sub of the sub. And then again, it happened, the sub of the sub. And then it could have happened again. It could have, but... The Lord has plans otherwise, because she's, she's ready to burst any day now, and she's ready to be done. So, and if you didn't know, my wife's pregnant, okay? So that's a bad analogy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Easy. I will take you out after service, though. <laughs> um, and wow, what a great honor I get to be here as youth leader preaching on Youth Worship Day so excited, and we're actually going to be uh, looking at Daniel 1, so if you have a Bible, uh, go ahead and open to Daniel 1, but that's like in the Old Testament. Yeah, I know, it's kind of ironic. It's, we're going to talk about youth, but it's in the Old Testament. Never mind, bad dad joke. Okay, all right, here we go. So, um, I think it's safe to say that this world's kind of jacked up. I think it's safe to say that, and um, I just want to tell a quick story, and then we'll get into... Uh, the, the blunt of the mes message here. Um, so we were in, on our honeymoon, we were in Cozumel, and you know how honeymoons go, well some of you might, um, and you first, you're like newlywed, and you're just so excited, like we're married, yay, this is great, and you're like so excited, and then we get off the boat, and we're like, this is beautiful, you're beautiful, she was saying that to me, of course, um, and I was like, okay, let's, let's get on, let's go take this scooter around the island, yeah, let's do that. It was perfect. So we get out, we're going, like we go through like this forest preserve looking thing and then we get around um, like the back side of the island and then there's the ocean. It was actually very, very, very pretty um, to be out there. And then especially on the honeymoon, yes, this is so beautiful. We're with each other, yay, feelings and stuff. Okay, so it was, it was great. It was, it was nice to be a part of there. By the way, a huge bug, like huge, like this big, hit me in the leg. Anyway, that doesn't matter. All right, so we're going, and all of a sudden, it hurt, okay? Um, we're going, but I had a man up, because I'm like, yeah, honeymoon, let's go. Okay, so we get around, and now we get into, like, the shop section, and I'm looking around, I'm like, and as we're going, I was just so, like, captivated by not only her, but everything that's going on in the, in the scenery. I have no idea where I'm at. I have no clue. Okay, she's like, she's like, should we call it my dad? I'm like, no, what's wrong with you? I will figure it out. So we're like, we're, we're somewhere in Mexico. I have no idea where we're at on this island. No, no clue where, which way is left, which way is right. No idea. And we had to ask somebody, uh, this is a long story short, obviously, there's a lot of hoopla that went along with that, um, a lot of laughs, a lot of panic. Um, so, and, the guy, and I'm like, man, this looks really familiar. And as it was kind of like that weird feeling where, like you might have had, it's almost like that vertigo feeling where you don't, you don't know what's happening. And like you're sitting in your car and the bus starts to move, but you're not sure if the bus is moving forward or if you're moving backwards. It was kind of like one of those, and you're like, I don't know what's happening, but at least I'm with you. So <laughs> finally, finally, the guy's like, yeah, it's right there. And sure enough, we just go like maybe two blocks forward. It was, honestly, it was, we just, the island's a circle. I'm an idiot, okay? It was right, it was right there. It was right there. And I tell that story because I feel like in today's 
culture, today's culture, we don't like to have that fixed point of reference. In today's culture, we don't want someone telling us truth or having that fixed point of reference, which this is church, so yes, I'm talking about God, okay, Jesus Christ. We don't have that fixed point of reference. Sometimes we'd rather just go along the waves or just go with the flow with things. So much so that last year, the 2016, and this is uh, from the Oxford English Dictionary, they have a word of the year. So much so that the word of the year last year for 2016, it kind of, the word of the year doesn't have to be a new word. It's not like they make up a word to, to have a word of the year. But the word of the year last year was called post-truth. So it's kind of interesting that last year the Oxford English Dictionary um, describes that being a post-truth year. It just has to, the word of the year just has to capture the passion of that culture. It just catches the passion. So what does that mean? Well, it means that nowadays we don't want that fixed point of reference, that true reference. We would actually want what's preferable. We want preference and opinions over fact and truth. And that's exactly what a post-truth culture is. We want, we're, we're, not, we're not denying that there's truth and fact out there. We're like, yeah, that's great, but you know what? I want to do this. I want to do this over here. I want to do my own thing. And we actually start to prefer opinions and preferences over facts and truth. So can we, this was awesome. Yeah. This was so cool. And all you youth in here, and all the parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, anyone who you've gone through your youth stages, anyone that's older, this message directly relates to you as well, not just the youth. It's for everybody, guaranteed. So have an open heart this morning. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Daniel 1, um, and let's just get into it. If you want, uh, we're at Daniel 1. And it says, Daniel's training. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it, overtook it. And the Lord delivered uh, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God, in Babylonia, and put in the treasure house of his God. So he took his stuff. Okay, now it's mine. Verse number three. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language. So if you have something to mark, it might be good to mark this down because this is where we're going to be going. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. Now this is the NIV, um, and it says Babylonians, and uh, in the actual true, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Translation, yeah, translation, it says Chaldeans. Okay, so I want you to remember that. We'll come back to that later. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years. Everyone say three. Three. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those, I'm at verse six, among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them the new names, and as you know, Daniel Belshazzar, Hananiah was Shadrach, Mishael was Meshach, and then Azariah was Abednego. Okay, and I think we're all kind of familiar with that story as well. All right, so what is happening? As it says in verse number uh, four, no, 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 I'm sorry. As it says in... 
Where was it? Okay. As it says in verse number four, way down right before, he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. The language and the literature of the Babylonians. In other words, he's just saying, you know what? You're coming in. It's like being assimilated into a new culture. Like, okay, we stole you. You're pretty good looking. I want you. You're tall. Get over here. You could serve. You look good. And they're just plucking people out. Okay, so he went over to um, Daniel and the other three, um, and he is now teaching them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. He's trying to teach them their culture. So that's where we're at right here. Okay, so what I want to get across today is just this. We are being attacked, the youth, not alone though, not just the youth, but adults as well, we are being attacked with this type of situation that went on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It's the same stuff today. Our youth is being attacked by the things of this world. Okay, so now we're going to get into it. Literature. That's what we're going to start with first. Literature. Okay, what is literature? It's writings, it's novels, it's poetry, it's history, it's laws. We, get, we all know what literature is. And, and besides, like, oh, I hated reading literature in English class. Okay, it goes beyond that. There's so much, so many other things that goes with literature. And the same stuff is happening. And what I mean by that is, um, well, let me say it this way. Why is that important? I think, actually, I kind of know that we, as humans, we believe in things written more than we give credit to. We believe in things written more than we give credit to. Um, You want to go buy a house? You want to buy a car? Are you just going to say, yeah, is is a handshake sufficient enough anymore? No, you're going to say, I would like that in writing. I want that in writing. You're going to make a business deal. You're going to make some kind of agreement. You're going to want something in writing. It was like the, 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 the student who was going to get his doctrine, okay, his doctoral degree, right? So he's going through and he was upset about the dissertation process because you have to cite sources and you have to do this. So when he was giving his speech, he was, he was blah, 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 would say something. And then he would say, like, as told to me from the guy at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> okay. And then the professor kind of looked at him like, okay. And then he would go on with his dissertation and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you know what? Um, as told to me from the waitress at wherever, Steak and Shake. Hmm. Okay? And the, the professor's like, wait, what, what are you doing? It, this has to be written documentation. He's like, why? I don't agree with that. And his whole dissertation was like that. So he went, went on and he did the same thing through the entire process. Well, they called him afterwards and they were like, you know what? You did a, you did a good job. We're actually going to pass you. Okay, we're actually going to pass you, um, but we're not going to send you your certificate. You'll just have to take our word for it. (laughs) Okay, so we actually believe in this written literature more than sometimes I think we give credit to. We believe in some of the things that we read, do we not? So what was being taught by the Chaldean? What was being taught in Daniel? Astrology? Magic, okay, sorcery, enchantment, all these things were being taught, like this is like basically, like in other words, witchcraft. I see dead people. (laughs) Not like right now, okay, that'd be weird, but awesome, no, no. Um, Like that, like communicating with dead people, like all these things were being taught, okay, So what's being taught today? It's the same stuff, different day. It's the same stuff, different day. So I did a quick Google search of isms, okay? How many isms are out there? It's just easily found, 234 isms, okay? And this is what I mean. Like, it was a list of isms because this is the literature that is, might be in your household now, what your youth, what your youngins are exposed to. Atheism, agnosticism, 
We have pluralism. We have sexism. We have racism. We have, oh, I love the middle schoolers. Every I'm a middle school teacher. Every time kids come up, like, oh, that's just, you know, boys over here, girls over there, you're going to play. That's sexist. No, no, it's not. Just go do what you're supposed to do, okay? <laughs> like, this, but this is what, like, there's, like, they have no idea of these concepts, right? But they're being taught them, and they're getting them from somewhere. And let me just throw this out there. I might be getting ahead of myself. But if you don't teach them, parents, someone's going to teach them. And if you don't have open dialogue with your, with your kid or with, not even kids, kids that you influence, if you don't have this open dialogue, someone's going to teach them. And there's a bunch of literature that is out there that is from the very pit of hell. Listen, all these isms, these aren't feelings, they're not beliefs, okay? Or I'm sorry, all these isms, they're feelings, they're beliefs. Their opinions, their preferences. That's what they are. God is not, Christianity is not an ism. Well, it's theism. Yeah, you're right. Okay, you're smart. Okay, you're right. But what I'm talking about is it can't, God can't be classified as an ism. God's not an ism. You want to know why? Because God's a person. And God wants to come down and have a personal relationship with every single one of you that are here today. No other God can do that. No other God. And let me just say this, as, as I'm coming up, this, these isms, I want you, well, it's going to be up on the screen. Um, I want you to look at uh, Galatians up on the screen here in a second. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Galatians 1, 6 through 9 says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which really, that's not a gospel at all. So all the stuff that you hear, it, God is saying, listen, all this stuff that you're hearing, it's no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion or trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel, everyone say we. Everyone say angel. If we or an angel present a different gospel than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. And then he goes on to say it again. We or an angel. That's like if Pastor Steve would get up and preach just this maniac sermon one day, which happens often, but I mean like really off the wall, okay, and says, which does happen often too, okay, so dang it, strike number two, okay, let's say he's not preaching God's word at all, but he's claiming it as truth, as God's word, let him be cursed, oh, that's like tough, no, let him be cursed, if he's not preaching God's word, if we or an angel tell you something different, then what we have in the Bible, then what God preached, let them be cursed. And that's like a couple other major religions. An angel, if you know your church history, angels visited other people and were founded because people saw angels come and then they made their own religion. You want to talk about it later? We can. We don't have that kind of time. But look, just look at life. Look at the scandal in politics, Right? Look, I mean, look at all that craziness. This literature is being bred and absorbed into all of us. I'm guilty of it. It's like sometimes it's better than like reality shows. It's because it's reality. Okay, so like I don't, I don't understand. So um, I like this quote by Ravi Zacharias. It says, um, we're so consumed with left and right, we forget about up and down. We're so consumed by left and right, some, we forget about up and down. There's a literature that is 100% truth. And that literature might be in your lap right now, might be on your phone. That literature is called the Bible. Number two, language. Language is important. This goes beyond just the language, um, like speaking a different language. It, it, that definitely entails or it, it counts for part of what they were teaching these four but it's not everything that it entails, okay? It's like when I have coaches' meetings. When I have a coaches' meeting for volleyball, I look at my parents and I tell them, I'm like, look, I think you're a nice person, 
And I believe you might have some athletic bones in your body. You might even play, have played volleyball before. But I don't need you screaming from the stands onto the court, telling them to run a C-slide or telling them to set the ball to the outer, the middle, or whoever. No, I don't need that. Why? Because the vocab is different. The language that w I'm trying to teach my guys is probably different than the language than they're, they're used to. It's like Xander, and, and then mass confusion happens. Xander, for example, he's trying to say Bobcat, but he says Baba. Baba. So he's out there with the foreman of the guy the other day, and he's like, Baba, and the guy's looking for a Baba. He's like, no, and then Pops is like, no, it's Bobcat. And he's like, Baba, yeah, Baba, Baba. Okay, if we don't teach the correct language, there's going to be confusion. Parents, if you don't teach the correct language to your lovelies, there is going to be confusion. I promise you that. Youth, if you don't learn and desire the correct language, and that's coming from the Bible, and that's coming from people you trust, if you don't, if you don't want that, you're going to go astray you're going to go somewhere completely different because they're going to get you. I guarantee, I don't mean to sound like he's going to get you. No, he's like, they're, the devil is out, as Pastor Steve mentioned, to rob, steal, and destroy. He really is. He really is. And today's messed up, that's for sure. Language, Webster Dictionary. Lingo, phraseology, communication, vocab, everything that I just said, that's language according to the dictionary. One of these um, languages and what I feel like was happening back then, they were trying to um, assimilate them into their culture. We know this, okay? So they're trying to, everything that you can imagine, and I'm trying to relate it to now. How can we get a glimpse of what was happening then and what is happening now? What's relevant now? Euphemisms. Euphemisms. We're taking a, a negative term and making it sound, oh, pleasant and nice sounding, okay? Euphemisms, Euphenism, okay? All right, and I just wrote down a couple. Downsizing, meaning we're cutting people we're, we're, or laying people off, okay? Um, here's a new one. Investigation. Nope, we're not going to use that. It's going to be called a matter, okay? Here's some other ones. Pornography. No. It's not, it's not pornography, it's adult entertainment. Because if you're an adult, yeah, just entertain yourselves. Adultery, not called that anymore, it's an affair. Strip joint, nope, it's a gentleman's club. You're a gentleman if you want to go to a strip joint. Abortion, and I'm not getting on you, I'm really not, but I'm telling you, God talks strongly against these things. These things are happening in today's world. Abortion, the right to choose. Exotic dancers, used to be called strippers, now they're called exotic dancers. Pedophiles, nope, that's intergenerational intimacy, and that's okay. And the list goes on. And you know some just sitting there, the list goes on. You shouldn't, as a Christian, we should not be afraid of these pleasant terms. We need to be aware of these pleasant terms, and we need to be aware that the language is trying to shape us and mold us more than meets the eye. It really is. And God talks about it. Because some of you are like, I'm going to need a verse for that. I'm ready for you. I got you. Isaiah 5, 20 through 21. Look at this. Is it on the screen? Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Uh-oh. Next one, verse 21. Preferences and opinions. Hello. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Listen, this is not me just preaching up here. God spoke this into existence so many years ago. How true is that today? Just relate it to your life. If you could just be real with yourself and ask, what am I looking at? What am I listening to? Time out. Literature, poetry, language. 
Where does that come? Music. Super heavy in music. Super heavy. What was Satan, as Alexis told us a while ago, what, who, who was Satan in heaven before he got struck down? Anyone? Anyone? Worship leader, hello. How do you think the enemy is going to get at you? Through music. One of the main means that he's going to attack our youth is through music. And I'm a teacher, and I can tell you that is 100% true. I just, I just see it. I just see it. Well, it was kind of funny, and I was like, okay, what are, some, what are some antonyms? If there was an antonym for language, right? But then before I get all the way down the list, and then I see this word, can't. Everyone say can't. Can't. Not like cannot, but like can't. I was like, I've heard that word before, but what's a can't? It's not cannot. I cannot do this. It's a can't. I don't know how else to explain it. It's a can't. C-A-N-T. That's, that's how you spell it. So I looked at it. And actually, some synonyms to go along with can't, because it's a synonym of language, means deceit, deception. And I didn't say this, but today's message title is, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. This word that's a synonym synonym to language means deception. Then I'm like, well, what's an antonym? There's only one, according to Webster. Maybe got tired, I'm not sure. Standard. Standard. Does that blow your mind? Does that rock your world? Language, deception, synonyms for language are deception, but an antonym against the language is standard. Pastor Steve said it a while ago. The world standard is non-standard. There is no standard. Whatever you want to do, whatever your opinion says, Whatever your preference leads you. Whatever you feel like being. And I just heard last night, I don't even know if this is true, but I told Alexis this when this, this all, all, this transgender stuff was, is, is happening and so on and so forth. These feelings, and I was like, people are going to start feeling like they're animals. And last night I hear, a couple nights ago, I hear someone like feeling like a hippo. I don't know if that's true. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like, people are, people are claiming these different things. I feel like this. There's no standard. But you know what? That fixed point of reference, that's a standard. That Bible you have, that's a standard. There is only one standard that will never leave you dry, that will never forsake you, that will always answer you, maybe not in a way that you want it, but in a way that you're going to need. And that's the Bible. And that's God. He is your standard. He is what we should base our entire life off of. We have to. That's our standard. And I've said it before. I'll say it again. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. It's so true. Pastor Steve has said it. I've said it at youth. I've said it to you. I'll say it. And I'll say it, and I'll say it to the cows come home. I don't know what that means, but it's good. (laughs) Don't be deceived, number three. This is the king's food, so we're going to continue to read here. um, If you're still at Daniel, on Daniel 1, um, Daniel 1, 8. But Daniel resolved, now listen, this is where we really get into the bread and butter. Resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. He asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my king. He's cray cray. Okay. Who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than any of the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servant for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water. Then compare our appearance with their appearance. And then he agreed. Then he tested them for ten days. Verse 15. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men 
who ate the royal food. Some of you are like, I need a diet. I'm doing that right now, okay? Because I want to look good. It's beach bod season, and I'm ready to go. Give me 10 days of veggies. I'm okay. All right, that wasn't the point. Obviously, we're going to get into that in a second. At the end, he looked better. So the guard took away their choice food and wine. Listen, he took it away. He took it away after the 10 days. He took it away and gave them vegetables instead. That means they ate vegetables and drank water for three years, not 10 days. He took it away, three years. Well, that's like the Daniel fast, like 10 days. No, no, no. You want to do the Daniel fast? How about three years? Vegetables and water. Can you imagine that? I'm just trying to make a case for that. Can you imagine that? Vegetables and water, and he looked better. And this wasn't like just regular, like we're talking like, steak, okay? You're talking like Texas Roadhouse, like just give me, you think the king was eating poorly? This is like your dream. This is like you go on a cruise and you have buffet and you could eat whatever. You go to those Brazilian restaurants and you just, you flip the little green card, you know, and they just keep meat, meat, more, more, yes. And then you're like, all right, we'll stop it at two feet, okay? This, this is exactly, and he's like, nope, Here's why. Here's why. Because he was like, you know what? Youth, look at me. You are in this world. You're in this world. And you got to go to school and you have to learn different things. And they might go against everything that you're being taught here. And Daniel and the other three are like, you know what? We're no dummies either. We understand that. But you know what? We got to get God's blessing somehow. We have to get God's blessing somehow. And you know what? We're going to abstain from eating the meat and drinking the wine. Just give us the veggies and water. That's it. And Lord, would you bless that? Parents, everyone in here, what can you set apart so God can bless it and use it in a mighty way more than you could even think he could use it. What can you set apart? What can we set apart? What can we not do? What can we sacrifice? And this is exactly what they were doing. He was sacrificing something so it could be blessed by the Lord. He wasn't indulging in like this super sustenance of food. He was sacrificing so the Lord would bless him. You know what else he was doing? He was being self-controlled. He was self-controlled over self-serving. He was being self-controlled. Man, I really want that. We've talked about food, and somehow food makes its way into my sermons every time. I don't, I don't know. Maybe because we're getting hungry around point three. I'm not sure, okay? Regardless, he's not self-serving. He's self-controlled. And if anything, he's wanting to serve others because of it. God changes our mindset. He changes us. And he's sober-minded. He was, you, he was sober-minded. Where well, you're saying, like, wine, it, like, messes with your mind? Yeah. Yeah. One ounce of alcohol, it's proven. You could go do the research. One ounce of alcohol decreases your ability to make a decision by however many percent. One ounce. Are you saying, like, I can't drink? That's not a conversation that we're getting into right now. But I'm just saying that if you want to be sober-minded, young people, adults, middle people, whoever, you want to be sober-minded, what are you bringing in? This is, a, this is a classic lust of the flesh. What are you bringing in? Are you smoking? Are you doing drugs? Are you drinking? Yes, this is a very deep conversation and all emails and phone calls to uh, Pastor Steve, please, okay? <laughs> but I'm just saying, you want to be sober-minded? Why did he want to be sober-minded, do you think? He wanted to be clear. Well, uh, I think I could get away with it. Listen to this verse, and I just read this in Peter. I think it was First Peter. Stay self-controlled and sober-minded for your prayers' sake. What? Self-controlled and sober-minded for your prayers' sake. You want, you want to know why God might not be hearing some of your prayers? Is because you're not self-controlled, because you're doing what you want, and you're not sober-minded because you're doing what you want. That's not me. 
That's God who's saying that. But like, I could do it on my own. And I could do all this. Guys, you can't. I'm telling you, you can't do it on your own. We need God. And at the end of it, and, and this is how I'll end, at the end of it all, <clears throat> and you could read here, and I'm just going to hurry here. <clears throat> and this is what it says um, at verse 18. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and found none equal to those four. So they entered the king's service. And moving down to verse 20. He found them ten times better than all the magicians, all the enchanters in his whole kingdom. Why? Because they set apart something for God's use. They said, you know what? I'm not going to conform to the things of this world, but I'm going to be transformed by your spirit. God bless me. They were ten times stronger. Ten times stronger. Remember what he stole in the beginning? He stole the tithe. Do you remember he stole from the house of God? He stole the tithe. He stole the tithe. So what did God do at the end? He, <laughs> what's the tithe? Ten. And what did he do at the end? He restored them ten times more than everyone else. Guys, I'm telling you. Youth, I'm telling you. Adults, I'm telling you. Peeps, I'm telling you. God will restore you. All you have to do is sacrifice be self-controlled, be sober-minded, and he will bless your way. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much, Lord, for the youth. Thank you so much for giving them talents and abilities and blessings, Lord, and I just ask that you would continue to be with them and strengthen them. Lord, I also pray for everyone that's here today. And Lord, I just, I know your word hit home with a lot of us this morning, with a lot of youth, with a lot of others in here, Father God, not just the youth, everybody, Lord, because your word is convicting. And we just ask that your word was used for that change here this morning. And if it was, Lord, and if somebody, and we do this every week, but if someone wants to turn to you, repent from their sin, per, repent from the ways of this world, the literature and the language of this world, everything that's being brought. If someone wants to turn from you today, we do this every week. You are not joining this church. You are simply coming into a relationship and fixing your standard on God. If you would like a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, starting on my left, would you look at me? We just lock eyes. If you, if you want to start that today, just look at me. Cool. On my right, just look at me. We'll just lock eyes for a second. No biggie. Just look. Just look. You don't want the things of this world anymore. Okay, and those of you who look, would you repeat after me? Just to yourself, please. And those who didn't look, you could still repeat this or please pray over those who did. Say, Lord, I receive you today. I repent from the things of this world. I want to follow you, your language, and your literature over what I've been. Lord, bless me today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Whew, would you stand as I close, please?